members of the public here. So please note that this meeting may be filmed for live and or subsequent broadcast via the Council's website. At the start of the meeting, the Chair will confirm if all or part of the meeting is being filmed. Um, majority of it's being filmed from what I can see. You should be aware that the Council is a data controller under the Data Protection Act. Data collected during a webcast will be retained in accordance with the Council's published policy. Members of the public seated in the public gallery will not ordinarily be filmed by the automated camera system. However, please be aware that by moving forward of the pillar or in the unlikely event of a technical malfunction or other unforeseen circumstances, your image may be captured. Therefore, by entering the meeting room, you are consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. Members of the public who participate in the meeting will be able to speak at an on-camera or off-camera microphone according to their preference. Please speak to a member of staff if you have any queries or concerns. OK, so let's start off then. Um, anyone has a declaration of interest? No? OK. And the minutes of the last meeting held on the 4th of January 2023. Can we all agree that they are correct? Thank you, Dokes. I'll sign them. OK, we have for noting the minutes of the Community Safety Partnership meeting. Can we note those minutes? OK, um, today we do not have any petitions. OK, we do have questions from members of the public. Uh, we have three questions. So to explain, this section is 30 minutes long. Um, you can ask a supplementary question if only if it is to clarify something regarding the initial question. OK, but um, seeing as only one of our questioners has arrived. Um, Ms Leach, would you like to come forward and ask your question? Try the other one. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So my question, um, my annual question, uh, concerns Reading Festival. Um, this year's Reading Festival attracted very bad publicity nationally and internationally on account both of its ecocidal aftermaths and two, the, the lawless behaviour in the campsites, leading to injuries amongst innocent young people caught in their tents. And I just want to insert here, um, I asked my daughter's friends to give an account of their experience um, at the festival. And this is just one of the messages I received earlier this afternoon. Uh, people played tent roulette. So they would run and jump on random tents and the bullet would be if there were people in the said tent. Lots of people were in K holes, which is uh, ketamine holes uh, sense or in disorientation and, and very, very frightening, often quite, um, uh, well, awful to witness and to experience. People offering free drugs. Um, I didn't, this is the quote, I didn't see any physical fights, but they were camp wars. So like throwing stuff over the trees into other people's camp. So we had full water bottles raining down on our camp from the other camp. You just had to hope not to get caught under one, ha ha. Tents set on fire on the last night. So that's a witness account. So this is raised every year and it just seemed to get worse this year. So I, my question is, what is the line that Reading Borough Council will finally draw in the sand? The line that says to Festival Republic, no, this is not acceptable. And you take responsibility and you take remedial action or you take your festival elsewhere. Thank you very much for your question and I invite Councillor Rowland, the lead councillor for environmental services, community safety, to make a response on my behalf. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank Ms. Leach for her question and also for her never ending support for the environment, ensuring also that we all take proper heed of the climate emergency. Uh, I'd also like to add my personal um, sympathies for the story that you just uh, expressed to us. Uh, your passion for the environment, I can assure you, is something that we all share. 
I would like to draw Ms. Leach's attention to the report on item nine of the Savings Agenda, which outlines positive forward initiatives for the 2023 event in more detail. I've ensured that Ms. Leach has had a copy of this. I do hope that she has been able to receive that. If not, we'll ensure that you get one. Um, Did I get yes, it yes, item, item not nine. Not time to read it for tonight. No. Right. Um, and would refer her to that and to invite her to stay, if possible, for the democratic discussion later this evening. It is only right and proper that that is the form to go into any specifics. Whilst it is agreed that there were concerns following the 2022 event, this is an overriding factor in why Councillor Hacker and myself, along with our Labour colleagues, pressed for an early public discussion with Best of Republic at this committee this past November. That meeting was very fruitful to have so early on, and tonight's report bears the fruit of that useful discussion. No one disagrees that the reports seen in the press were not concerning and sad to read, and our sympathy very much goes out to the story that you shared and also to all of those affected. However, what was seen presented in the press was not always typical of the event as a whole. As ever, a full debrief had been held with Festival Republic, Reading Borough Council, and other stakeholders, <laughs> including Thames Valley Police, and plans have been reviewed ahead of this year's event, taking, concerns, taking those concerns into account, looking to areas where significant strides forward could be made. A good deal of work goes into the festival across many teams at the council and with external stakeholders. Both the council and Festival Republic accept that there are always improvements that could be made, and this is taken on board and implemented to ensure the event continues to improve and be a success. Given the significant positive strides that have been made towards the shaping of this year's festival, I am positive that the relationship that this council has with the festival is bearing successful results for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Do you have a supplementary question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, understand what democratic discussion means, considering that these same issues have been raised year on, year on, year on, year on. And um, Tony McGinn's drone footage was not press. It was an individual who lives in Reading who took categorical and undeniable drone footage of the aftermath of the ecological destruction that was left behind again. And um, when you say what was presented in the press was not typical of the event as a whole, I think it's the young people on the ground who have the witness reports that should be should be taken into consideration. The fact that one of these sorry, have you got a question? Yes, they to, are yeah. questions. We can't have another, in that my Ms. my Leach, question has not Ms. been answered. Ms. Leach, we are asking you to ask questions. My question not another hasn't been answered. Speech. At what? They're, they're all part of the response. It's not a speech. Well, it's your a democratic please, right to can you please querying. Could you please state your questions? Yes, my question is at what point will Reading Borough Council, what is the line that Reading Borough Council will finally draw in the land in the sand? The line that says to Festival Republic, no, this is not acceptable. And you take responsibility and you take remedial action or you take your festival elsewhere. Thank you. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and I thank Ms. Leach for her supplemental. Uh, I believe your question was uh, in regards in the first part to the uh, democratic process that I uh, talked about uh, in discussion of item nine. Um, as you can tell, although the opposition bench is a little bit sparse of, of members, uh, we come together as uh, normally four parties uh, here but uh, tonight only three, and we have a robust discussion about the, um, about the festival. Um, we had one in November, and uh, um, I, I remember that Councillor Cresswell uh, made some very interesting points, along with members from this side, and uh, I believe Councillor Singh raised some points too at that, at that meeting. So what we did was we challenged them uh, about issues, and that is what the report does uh, discuss here tonight. We will be reviewing that report in a democratic fashion, again, taking points from, from all parties to, um, to address any of the questions that have been responded to from the November meeting and any additional improvements that can be made. So, uh, and item nine, that will be discussed and it will be going, it will be going on. So that's really my response. I do take on board the, the stories, the, you know, the, and certainly extend our sympathies 
I don't to want any sympathy. to any we don't situation. Want we want so action. thank you very much, Ms. Leach. We thank want you. action. You thank still you. haven't answered the question. I would just like to point that out. And democratic discussion Ms. is Leach. only discussion if action Ms. gets Leach. taken. Thank you very much Robert's for your time. Rules. Thank, thank you. you. Good. As the other questioners are not here, they will be sent a copy of the response so they'll be able to see what um, the, the query question answer is. Right, then we have no decision book references. No. no? And so we will move on to item seven, which is Reading Culture and Heritage Strategy, Strategy Statement of Intent 2023 and 2026. Simon Smith. Thank you, committee. Thank you, chair. Um, this report is um, a culture and heritage strategy statement of intent. Um, as the report notes, this uh, report has been on a been on a journey, uh, and it picks up on previous committee meetings, uh, picking up on the uh, culture and heritage strategy 2015 to 2030. Um, there was a request to produce a, a action plan updating the strategy. Um, however, through collaboration, through listening. Uh, to the to the cultural sector and through engagement and collaboration, uh, including a, a day that was attended by many, many groups back in the summer, uh, an action plan uh, was felt to be less suitable than um, what we've produced here as an appendix, which is a statement of intent. Um, a smaller strategic group will look to take the themes forward that are listed in the statement of intent. And I think it is highlighted in the report, but just to further note that the proposals um, are not committing the council or strategic partners to uh, funding provisional delivery. Uh, the intention or the, the statement of intent is there to set a direction of travel, to provide some shared aims for the sector to coalesce around. Uh, any actions that require funding will depend on the budget being secured via external funding. Uh, and so really the report has set out, seeks committee approval to approve the shared statement of intent and uh, work with the, uh, allow the strategic group to develop the statement of intent and the actions and return to committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor um, Barnett Ward. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And I think Simon's used two words there that are really important, which is collaboration and listening. So this isn't something that is owned by the council. This is something that we're doing in partnership with Reading's cultural uh, community and something that we're doing in to hopefully to support them. But what I would like to draw members attention to is the is how we have cross referenced um, the uh, statement of intent. I have to keep saying statement of intent. I was saying this beforehand, I would get it wrong. Uh, how we cross referenced in the statement of intent with our corporate themes. And it, I think it's very easy to just set culture and leisure aside as nice to have. So they're not. They are ways that we can push forward the things that are important to us and they're important for community engagement as well. Um, and it's a shame that Ms Leach hasn't stayed as, as she was invited to do because there is a section in here about sustainability of festivals from the Reading Climate Action Network um, and how we're working towards using the, the cultural sector, also working towards uh, climate neutral, zero waste uh, festivals. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Gaia to look forward to coming to the town hall as part of the climate festival. Our reaction to the climate emergency is a thread through everything that we do at the council. It's not just a add on or something that we require from all people such as Festival Republic. It's something that we do ourselves. It's something that we work with the cultural uh, sector with. So it's, I'm really pleased to see this and uh, to continue the ongoing work that we do with our partners across Reading. Yep, thank you very much. I'm very much excited about Gaia arriving in town. Um, I've seen it in other places and have been insanely jealous and now I need not be. So that will be excellent. I have um, Councillor Cresswell. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for this. It's, uh, it's very welcome and very well put together. Um, the one comment I have is maybe a little bit detailed, but the, the definition of creativity in the letter of intent I think it could be broadened somewhat. Um, creativity is often referred to as um, having two strands to it. There's the arts and the more problem solving type science kind of side 
and certainly in psychology literature, that's how it's defined. And um, which would so if we broadened our creativity definition, we could bring in all the wonderful climate work, or lots of stuff that's done at Reading University, Ed Hawkins stripes, that kind of thing. So I think that would work very well too. Um, Reading's advantage, and and also link to a lot of the the kind of activity that will be our heritage in the future, like the 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 climate change work being done at Reading University and that kind of thing. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? Sorry. Um, yeah, just to respond, I'll, I'll take that away. Um, I think some things are linked to uh, funding and funders, but um, having a definition to coalesce around is something that we want to make you know as broad and inclusive as possible. So we'll have a look at that. Thank you. I've got Councillor Lanzoni. Uh, thank you, Chair. Very quickly, I just wanted to make a comment on this report because I think it's very commendable, both from the point of view of the content, but also from the point of view of the methodology. Um, apart from setting very interesting and challenging uh, strategic objectives, which I think they are really interesting, I really wanted to bring the attention to what I feel has been the methodology behind it, which is around the Council contributing to setting some strategic goals without somehow forcing the local cultural community on an action strategy. So the fact that uh, I will say we, but actually I should congratulate uh, the, the, all you, all the officer working on the um, culture and obviously it's the lead councillor for uh, leisure and culture so not um, it would have been very easy to somehow uh, forcing on the cultural community some some action to uh, an action plan to do and being able as council to tick some boxes the fact that we've been open and resilient and uh, we haven't forced actions on them i think is really really a commendable um, action and something which shows a degree of uh, resiliency, I would say, that uh, I would like to see potentially even more. Thank you very much. Councillor Rowland. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, I, I also would like to commend this uh, report and think that um, as, as the former person that sat uh, in this, uh, in, in um, Council Barnett Ward's seat, uh, that it is an entirely appropriate response uh, to, the, to the community and the, the cultural community uh, today in terms of a statement of intent and uh, the supporting nature that Reading Borough Council uh, can give to that community. I attended the workshop on July or back in July probably is a bit of a hangover from uh, <laughs> from my change position and also out of out of interest. And that was very much the feeling uh, of that community and I could really sense it. So I'm really, really pleased with this report. Um, the other point that I'd like to pick up kind of kind of follows from uh, Councillor Cresswell's uh, discussion in regards to uh, his definition of creativity. Uh, but I, but I will uh, choose to talk about the definition of heritage and the way it was applied uh, in in this. And um, although I think it is, I, I do think it's it's very good and it's very right. Um, you know, it's it's something that I will always um, wax lyrical about because heritage is so much and. Uh, the cultural heritage and the cultural richness of this town extends so much into who Reading is and the whole made in Reading, uh, being Reading uh, theme. Um, I can only point out, uh, for example, with the High Street Heritage Action Zone, just how much of the cultural heritage of the Oxford Road that that program has been able to bring forward and to show the richness. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I talk about it because I live near the Oxford Road too. Uh, but it really, it really does talk about that heritage and and um, just how the the day to day on the Oxford Road is creating that culture that has been in existence there for so many years, and it's just that wonderful evolution that it is absolutely perfect in the way that it is today because we are making history and we are creating heritage 
every single day. And um, yeah, okay, my goosebump moment is over and uh, I do commend this report. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cresswell. Thanks, Chair. I just have one extra point, which was <clears throat> in your paragraph 6.3, there's a discussion about um, um, not wanting to attract too many people to come to the town because a large tourist attraction would increase travel. I paraphrase badly. Um, I, I would just like to encourage everyone to kind of balance against that the notion that um, at the moment lots of residents will travel out of Reading for cultural things. So, so um, it's it's not clear whether the addition of, of uh, more cultural activity in the town it, it will, will increase or decrease travel and therefore it shouldn't be a negative arguably shouldn't be a negative motivator yep fair point fair point and i think we just have to take a moment to think how lucky we are to have the breadth of cultural organizations that we do um, who work so well together. I was at the Cultural Education Partnership um, meeting on Tuesday and it's a collaborative thing, culture in this town. They're not working against each other, they're working together to produce something that is really rather fantastic. Um, and like you said, culture um, creativity is broad. Scientists, in my view, are creative, engineers are creative, as well as artists as well. So yeah, fair point, well made. Right then, are we able to then recommend, um, agree the recommended action on page 17? Yep. Excellent. Then we'll move on to agenda item eight. Oh, it's okay today. I like. I will. I shall do that. I like. It's a miserable evening. Um, Ms. Cobb, I see you have arrived, so I shall use my chair's discretion to allow you to ask your question because you have battled rain and cold temperatures. So if you'd like to come forward and take a seat, press the button on the um, in the middle. It should go red. And then you can ask your question. Yes. You may have a supplementary, we don't know. OK, so Madam, Madam, Madam Chair, councillors, officers, um, I, I'm aware that residents of Kate in the Catesgrove Ward have significant concerns about the issue of fly tipping and rubbish being disposed of in at public bins through. I'm wondering what environmental and enforcement action has the council taken to prevent and, and deter this scourge? Thank you very much. And I ask um, Councillor Rowland, Lee Councillor for Environmental Services and Community Safety to make the response on my behalf. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank Mark Cobb for this question uh, and for the Chair's discretion to allow someone that's probably made it in uh, through very cold weather to, to come. Um, so um, I would just like to say that uh, it provides me an opportunity to highlight the breadth of work of our environmental enforcement team. Fly tipping of waste around public bins is an offense that is enforceable under Section 33 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990. Any party that can be evidenced to have committed such an offense may be subject to a 400 pound fixed penalty notice or FPNs as we call them. In respect of Catesgrove Ward, the team have issued 15 fixed penalty notices for waste deposit offenses, litter and fly tipping within the past year. The majority of these fixed penalty notices have been linked to residential addresses rather than commercial. I will come back to these residential infractions in a minute. Concurrently, over the last 12 months, the enforcement team in Cates Grove have completed trade waste duty of care inspections under Section 34 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 at businesses along Whitley Street, Pell Street, Basingstoke Road and London Street, which is part of our wider ranging work to ensure that retail areas all around the town are properly disposing of and have proper regimes in place to handle their rubbish. The environmental enforcement team regularly conduct inspections of waste found to have been deposited around public bins, where evidence attributing the waste to a named individual or business premise can be found. The team may take enforcement action in the form of a fixed penalty notice and or prosecution, all of which will take place alongside education about proper recycling and waste management. 
where there is a pattern of behavior or recurrence of issues in a specific location, the team are able to erect signage to act as a deterrent to the behavior. The signage advises of the offense and the penalties that those that engage in the activity of fly tipping may face. New stickers have recently been designed yeah. to be placed on litter bins as an advisory deterrent for leaving rubbish next to the public litter bins and those are being applied around the borough. Alongside enforcement being applied where justified, education is a very integral part of the work we do with our enforcement team. Wherein fly tipped waste has been determined to have come from residential properties, it has been noted that such bags frequently contain items that could have easily been recycled. This is indicative of a household that is likely not managing their recycling correctly, which if applied properly should create ample room in their gray bin, or it can be from a large single family household or an HMO or multi-tenanted situation where there may be issues that justify the need for a larger capacity bin. Officers, when alerted, will provide a bin audit to a resident exhibiting capacity issues to determine whether the householders are maximizing all recycling possibilities. Issues such as you are describing are often but not exclusively found in highly transient areas of the town. Additionally, English language only communications may not be sufficient to educate all residents about proper recycling and rubbish collection. Landlords and agents are expected to play a role in that, but frustratingly with some, that has proven to be an unreliable source of information sharing. The team of printed educational material that can be shared with residents to encourage responsible waste disposable behaviors, such as the proper use of household waste bins or taking the rubbish to the tip. Recycling guides have been translated into multiple languages, including Romanian, Polish, and Nepalese, and we are looking to increase our reach of information in other languages, as being able to reach all residents is an ongoing challenge in a town like Reading, which openly welcomes diversity in this town. In respect of enforcement, in extreme cases, the team has mobile CCTV cameras that can be deployed to monitor a hotspot area and attempt to capture footage that would support a successful prosecution. CCTV cameras, however, are most effective when they can be used in fly tipping hotspot areas where waste is deposited from vehicles as registration plates are the most clear cut way to identify individuals. It is obviously harder to capture random, more widely spread random fly tipping by residents, often under cover of night or on foot by that method. The work is ongoing in a town that sees new residents every day and the team is here to educate as well as to prosecute those offenders who know better but continue to disrespect the structure in which we collectively recycle and collect rubbish. We will continue to investigate waste deposit offenses and duty of care breaches. The team will always seek to engage with residences, uh, re residents, businesses, and private landowners regarding their waste management responsibilities, doing what we can to ensure public awareness and by application of fines where warranted to promote a change in the behaviors in those that may consider committing such an offense. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Ms Cobb, do you have a supplementary question? It has to refer to the original I do, I do question. Indeed. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rowland, for your detailed and re response to my question. It's a lot, a lot of information to to digest. I have, I do have some further ideas of ways that ways of um, for, gu for guidance for lo local local res residents, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to come to Kate's Grove and have a look at some of the issues for me with me. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cobb, for your supplemental. Of course, I'd be happy to uh, come and visit the area and uh, receive and discuss any any ideas that you have and and to look at the hot spots if indeed you know or where they exist and all of that and let's see what we can do together sure thank you, thank you. Thank you very much Ms Cobb I'm not sure it other councillors do ask questions at this point apologies if I'm, in, I'm wrong but it's been a long day um thank you very much for making the effort to come in today okay would you like me to leave now you can stay if you want oh, <laughs> turn your light off yeah We'd love the company. Right, on to agenda item eight, which is the, oh, very distressing. Reading Library's Improvement Programme, Disposal of Library Stock. Imagine getting rid of a book, couldn't do it. 
Thank you, Chair and Committee. Um, so this report uh, seeks to um, actually formalise something which hasn't been formalised before, um, which is the withdrawal of library stock. Um, the only reason that we would withdraw library stock is because we keep buying new library stock. Um, so ultimately it's a way of um, dealing with the fact that we're constantly buying new material. Um, it seeks to um, basically formalise a number of routes for disposal of disposal of stock. Uh, ranging from dealing with companies that will deal with surplus library stock, which often is very life expired, not in the best condition um, you can imagine, I'm sure, um, and seeking to balance that kind of high volume, high turnover um, withdrawal with uh, withdrawal of stock that is uh, more possibly older or more specialist in nature. Um, the stock is only withdrawn based on use, need, quality and condition, as is set out in the report. Uh, and there are safeguards in place to deal with um, items that relate to to Reading, of a particular place in our in our town's history and story, uh, of which we have a, a great number. So the report seeks to um, formalise the approach, allow a range of uh, disposal options, um, but just to highlight that, uh, as I said at the start, the withdrawal of library stock is necessary because we're constantly buying new stock. It does allude in the report to um, the new new potential new central library um, and obviously that's kind of focused attention on making sure that we have things in place that allow us to do what we'll need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Barnett Ward. Uh, yes, thank you Chair. Um, and just in case some, anybody only read the titles of reports tonight and has had a little panic, we're not suggesting but that we're disposing of our library stock. This is, uh, as Simon said, management of the natural wastage of stock that has always happened on a common sense basis. But what is truly common sense is to have a procedure for that and to have that agreed. And that's what we're doing here. And as Simon mentioned, the reason we need it is because we're going to be moving Central Library to this building and having a fantastic new library fit for the future. And we need to make sure that what we're bringing across is the correct stock. Um, if anyone has had the opportunity to go behind the scenes in Central as I have. There's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Not all of it needs to come here. Uh, but we have also, within this report, looked at ways of making sure that we are disposing of it sensibly. As you'll see, there's a lot of detail about that in the stock, and I'm sure everyone's been into a library and seen books available for 10p, 20p donation or whatever. Uh, we're not in the business of just dumping books. It's just making sure that the books that we have in Reading, in our libraries, using up our shelf space, are the right books for Reading, and that if there are better places for books to be, that's where those books go. Thank you. Yes, books that are so well loved that they are being retired. Yes, Councillor Cresswell. Uh, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> thanks for this. It looks very well formulated. I have um, lots of sympathy for the issue, having spent at least six weeks moving library books along two metres um, at one stage in my early career. Um, my question is, um, how does the capacity of the new planned central library compare to the capacity of the current central library? Uh, I think we're at a stage where we don't, other than the pictures of the building, pictures of the outside of the building, and there are some pictures, some indicative pictures in the bid that were submitted. Um, it's slightly less, but broadly not a huge difference. And the only reason that in terms of stock capacity, we haven't got numbers for that, that yet. Um, but what I would say is uh, at Central Library currently, um, it is a building which uh, doesn't make the most efficient use of space. So there is plenty of space like is, is before us really with nothing in it apart from circulation space. What we'd be looking to deal with uh, in any potential new space is uh, working with specialist people to maximise the amount of space that we have. So there will be thousands and thousands of books, obviously, um, but we'll be looking to have a really inspirational space that showcases the books and the diversity of what we've got, uh, but balances that with what people would like to see in the new in the new space. Thank you. Um, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure whether this is the appropriate forum to ask, it's probably not, but I've always been curious as to what the plans will be for the current site of the Central Library. Is it possible to have a little inkling as to what might happen there when the library relocates over to this side? 
that's not somewhere we're at at the moment. So, so no. But I think to to reassure committee that um, any there will have to be a lot of reports coming through regarding the whole process, and that will all be clearly set out. Thank you, Councillor Kitchingham. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say how great it is to hear such a lot of good news coming out about Reading's library service, um, given that the formalisation of this policy is all preparation for moving to the exciting new premises here. And this is coming on top of the fact that Reading has done so well in not closing any libraries, whereas so many towns have had to cut back on their library service. We've recently also abolished fees and fines, which will help to make our libraries not only modernised, but really welcoming and inclusive places. So it's absolutely lovely to hear all this good news coming out. Thank you. It certainly is. And it means that no matter what your income, you'll still be able to access good quality literature, which I think is very important. So any more? I can't see any more indications. OK, so then can we agree the recommended action on page 31? Thank you. Okie dokes then, on to item nine, which is the Reading Festival update. I'll just wait for the officer to come forward. Thank you, Chair. So yes, this is uh, the Reading Festival update. So um, at committee in November last year, it was agreed to provide a further update on plans for Reading Festival 2023 at this committee. Uh, the update provided to committee in November was in part a closed session due to the commercial nature of the discussion and some proposals were yet to be finalised. So this paper aims to update on those proposals, um, follow up on some of the questions that were raised at the time and provides a bit of an overview of the event, which is in the planning phases for this year. So um, as you probably all know, Reading Festival um, is a licensed event um, and it's held in the August bank holiday each year. Um, the license capacity is um, still set at 104,999. Um, there aren't any proposed changes to the actual layout of the arena this year um, with the keeping of the two main stages that we had last year with the East and West, um, which operated quite well for the festival organisers. Um, so I'll sort of go on to just the, the changes that we've got within the report that are occurring. So as Councillor Rowland um, stated earlier, there were concerns following the 2022 event and these matters have been discussed at, at length with the Festival Republic at, at our debrief, along with um, all of our stakeholders, which included um, a wide number of people like the, the Fire Authority, uh, Thames Valley Police, um, uh, various uh, river cruise companies um, and then sorry, lost my train of thought um, and then all of the offices within um, Reading Borough Council. Um, so Festival Republic have since proposed a number of initiatives um, taking concerns into account um, and I sort of reference those in detail within the report but I'll just summarise them here. Um, so they're implementing Challenge 25 which is a change from Challenge 21 um, so the Challenge 25 is actually an industry standard which allows for that margin of safety um, mm -hmm. when trying to prevent the sale of alcohol to underage 18 or under 18s, um, which we think is a good step forward. Um, they're introducing key points within the campsites um, to ensure campers have access to support and information over a 24 hour, seven day, well, throughout the whole of the event um, where the campers are operating. Um, and that's to make sure that there's better visibility, better security um, and just general more presence within the campsites. So the campsites are zoned, um, as you might if you've been to the event, so different colours. And so there's going to be an information point within each of those campsites. Um, they're increasing the number of safeguarding officers um, as well um, to that they've had previously to make sure again that there's a better 24 hour response throughout the event. Um, there also, which I think is a, you know, personally for working in environmental protection, is um, the banning of campfires this year, um, which will be see the first year where we've had no campfires, and we've also had officers already working with businesses to ensure that they understand there's no sale, they don't need to provide, you know, bring in stock of extra wood and things like that, so we can um, make sure we don't bring any wood on site. Um, then we've also continued to work with the river safety. 
um, with support from external agencies like the Berkshire Fire and Rescue, the Police um, the Environment Agency, Marine Response and the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. So I'm sure again, we've got presence along the river. Um, so I think last year they uh, managed to seize um, sort of quite a few drugs and things and stuff like that on the river. So this should be good to have the presence again. Um, we're also working with trading standards offices to manage the underage sales of vapes. Um, obviously, that's a, a new, well, relatively new thing. So we're trying to work um, with offices along that and continued involvement with the safety initiative with Ask Angela. Um, so we continue to um, work with that campaign and ensure that um, all staff across the festival are aware of that. Um, this also aims to double the size of the eco camping area for this year's event. I understand that um, there's been a, an increased uptake in the number of people that want to use that area, um, which is a quite positive result for last year's event. Um, and then just sort of moved on to sort of the, the councillor questions that were raised at um, last um, committee in November. So Camp, Councillor Emerson raised um, concerns about the harm of some social media groups, Festival Republic and social media team. They are exploring how social media can be used more proactively and positively to reassure or respond to those community forums and groups and pages um, set up. And again, with our internal comms and stuff, we're aiming to improve that for the 2023 event. Um, and then um, it's noted that Councillor Cresswell inquired about the emissions for waste and the classification of scope three it's in the report. Um, so I know scope three encompasses emissions that are not produced by the company itself and are not the result of activities from assets owned or controlled by them, but they are associated with the organisation of the event, for instance, transportation, distribution of goods. So example um, might be that the festival co have contractors with their caterers but those caterers aren't obviously local to Reading um, and they travel from festival to festival. So the benefit of scope three would be for the festival organisers to look at hotspot monitoring in their supply chain and try and engage with employees, for example, to reduce their emissions and using sustainable transport or shared travel. Um, so they're sort of working towards that. Um, so the report itself um, does detail a bit more about the waste stuff and Festival Republic did provide that. So if there's any specific further questions, I can take that back to Festival Republic to, to get those answered. Um, I would like to just raise that there is an amendment to the report at 0.5.18. Um, it's estimated that 38% of tents were left behind at Reading 2022 um, compared to 59% of tents that left behind in Reading 21, which, which is actually the absolute decrease is 21%, not the 35% that was um, stated in the report. So I just apologise for that error. Um, that's the summary of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. And I'd, I'd like to thank um, um, the officer for her report. Um, Overall, and I'm, I am very sorry that that um, um, the former questioner w did not stay around tonight because really what we've got here is some some really good news, some really positive news. And I, I put that down uh, firstly to thank uh, Festival Republic, to thank our officers and to thank all the organizations and agencies that contribute to the success and for being fulsome and taking on board uh, many of the suggestions that we brought forward in November. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we uh, collectively asked them to come forward in November, which is not something that we have done uh, quite so early in the season and quite so quickly after the event. That I feel prompted a good number of better responses, more wholesome responses, and more time for them, honestly, to um, get the sense that that Reading Borough Council, uh, uh, while it, while a critical critical uh, friend and and player uh, alongside them uh, in that respect, also expects and requires improvements year on year which I would have to say uh, they have certainly delivered. I mean, uh, the the somewhat reduced numbers uh, as reported in here, but still a big, huge success that we are 21% down on the tents that were left behind uh, from last year is still a really positive story that I know that they will continue to beat down through the programs that they 
they have put forward and that messaging about uh, taking away and removing tents. Uh, so that is a really, really good thing. Uh, the, the fact that the eco site was such a success that they're looking to double it, that also contributes to the amount of tents simply that are left on the ground by participants. Uh, and it was it was a really, really wonderful and greatly subscribed to uh, activity there. Um, the other thing is to uh, in regarding the um, the banning the bonfires, um, the, which is just absolutely um, um, a real it's, it's a it's a cultural shift, uh, but it is the right thing to do. It is the right time to do it. Some could argue that it could have been done uh, many years uh, before, but it is something that we've been working through with them and it is extremely well appreciated and will make a huge difference uh, to the air around um, around the town and and certainly in terms of safety. Um, Catherine has also already pointed out the, the number of really, really positive uh, safety steps that they are taking, the Challenge 25, the managing the underage sale of vapes uh, and their proper disposal, uh, all of the other things that you mentioned. Um, the I applaud also their transparency around scope three emissions and their, their willingness to look to improve that in the future. So all in all, um, this is something that has really taken some considerable strides forward. Uh, I know in some years we've not seen as dramatic strides that we've gotten this year, but um, I'm thrilled for that. And I do in indeed look forward to this next year with the festival. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Um, and yeah, the Sabacs actually, I, I know this year, so that doesn't make me feel quite as old as usual. So yeah, it's great. Councillor Lazzoni. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I represent Caversham Ward and um, for us Reading Festival is a big thing. Um, I've been councillor only one year as everyone here knows, but um, every time the time of the year comes closer, we hear a lot from our residents. Um, Reading Festival is a source of many opportunities for Reading and for Caversham and source of some issues. Sometimes joking, I say in those days it looks a little bit like the barbarian invasions because you've got these storms of um, teenagers um, invading in a very nice way uh, Caversham. Um, some of these issues have been mentioned, in particular one which is very, well two which are very close to my uh, sensibilities are uh, waste um, and waste management and the other is uh, safety and the safety of residents but especially the young people in the. I must say so that I've seen year on year constant improvements, at least in the last. Um, well, I've been living in Caversham for seven years, in the last seven years. Um, so I want to, while I will keep moaning uh, when we will talk uh, about Reading Festival, I definitely want to commend the work Reading Borough Council and in particular the, the uh, licensing team must clearly have done with Reading Festival and Festival Republic, but also commend Festival Republic themselves for working with us in a very open way um, and having obviously improved aspects that we pointed year on year as criticalities. And I think that while obviously we can keep improving, um, we should somehow uh, acknowledge the work they have done and obviously uh, you officers have done. Um, if I can make a very, very last comment, it would be very nice if just asking a question maybe with a little bit of a aggressive attitude was enough to improve things and, and leave in the chamber. I think the right attitude is keeping working on it not hiding the problem, but discussing discussing them 
uh, together, trying to see the point of view of the other people involved. And 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 I think we have done a good job also with the colleagues of the opposition in the last year, and I hope we will keep doing it in the next years and improving on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Barnett Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Dennis and I spent a lot of time uh, at Reading Festival last year. Um, unfortunately, not listening to the acts. I don't think I was in the arena at all when any acts were going on. Uh, what we did is we went and we looked at the campsites. We looked at how the vendors were managing things. We looked at vapes. Um, we looked at how things were being managed behind the scenes and we went round with, uh, with um, Festival Republic and also with some of their environment teams to actually see how on the, green, on the ground they were managing the festival. And I think something that's really important to note, particularly for people who maybe have been along to the festival but not camped, is the huge age difference between uh, the people who are generally there in the arena and they used to you step into the campsite and they are babies. They are so young. They are 16 and 17 year olds. And it is really unfair, I think, to turn to Festival Republic and say that they should be managing their festival in a way such as uh, comparable to Glastonbury, for example, which has a much older um, audience who will behave in a different way and camp in a different way. Although Glastonbury actually is much less sustainable than Reading as far as transport goes. We are one of the most sustainable festivals on transport because we're, it's right by the railway station. So there is a different approach has to be taken and what was wonderful was um, on the last day that we visited, uh, people were packing up and going home and there were bits of the site, which just they did look awful. And I, I do understand why Miss Leach gets so upset uh, and looking at the picture and stuff. It did. Um, but then we turned the corner onto the eco camp and it was beautiful. It was a clear field. People were packing up, people were taking all their stuff. There was a little bit of um, a couple of tents left in the corner. Um, run, it was run by Fest Buddies and they have did absolutely fantastic work. It was really intensive work they did with people. Everyone who came in had to sign a pledge. They were very cross about those two bits of broken tent because they shouldn't have been there. Uh, they should have been removed and the people had managed to get off without them noticing that they'd left them. But we also spoke to some of the people on that site who said what an amazing experience it was to be on the eco site, wanting to go back to the eco site next year and how it felt very, very different. But part of that also was they said, and I did find this a bit funny, it's an older crowd, we're all sort of 21, 22. And I thought, <laughs> God. <laughs> Which is like, thank you so much for making me feel ancient. But just those few years does make a difference. Reading Festival is the weekend after GCSEs. It is very shortly after A-levels. It is a lot of people in the, in the south, they see Reading as a rite of passage. In the north, it's Leeds. We have to understand the distinctness of this festival and the distinctness of the challenge. That doesn't mean that we can't sort it out. But there are things that other um, festivals can do. For example, Glastonbury have banned all sales of camping equipment on site. You have to bring your own equipment and it makes people want to take it away. We have people selling camping equipment in Reading Festival. I saw on the on the Saturday and the, the Friday and the Saturday, you could see the type of blow up mattresses they were selling. And then you could see those have been left behind because people, I think, just couldn't carry the extra equipment. But it's not as simple as just saying, well, ban sales of camping equipment on site because the range is right there. We, we are in a town, people can do it. So uh, it's you have to be nuanced in the approach. And I think it's not good enough to suggest that we should just t uh, say to Reading Festival that they should take a hike. It, it's part of our town. It's part of the distinctiveness of our town. Um, people love it. It's one weekend a year and it's not, it, it would be hugely irresponsible for us to say, oh, we don't think we're going to manage to get any better, this, any better environmentally. So we want them to go and take any problems they've got to someone else's field. How about we just solve the problems rather than try and shove them off onto somebody else? And 
they really are. I think anyone who's got the opportunity to spend time with Festival Republic to go and have a look around, do do that because they are putting the time in. They really care about it. We, we were on the Sunday, we were helping people pack up their tents. They had eco teams going around and there were people who were struggling and they would dive in. They, they um, Some of them were so good at putting tents down. I was like, they'd go, because we've been doing it all day. And they practice it as teams so they can dive in there. They see someone's about maybe going to give up, maybe leave that tent. They go and they do it and they pack it up and they give them the praise for doing it and the encouragement for doing it. So we, work, we chip away at it, we chip away at it, we chip away at it. But it is something that is so special in a lot of young people's lives and I don't think it's good enough to say that that's something that we should pull away from them. I think it's great that Reading is a part of, of young people's memories of how they celebrated their exams and going forward. Uh, and, I, and I, for one, uh, celebrate that. Thank you. As a, as a seasoned camper, putting away a tent can be very difficult. Um, Councillor Creswell. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to echo what people have been saying about the importance of engaging and keeping pushing and asking for decent reporting, but also celebrating the successes. And it, it seems like there are many initiatives that Festival Republic are putting in that are having an effect. So that's good. And we can encourage them to focus on the trickier problems like council bond orders indicated in camping equipment and the like. Um, the headlines were all about mountains of plastic bottles. So I have some hope that the deposit scheme that we're going to hear about in a later item may bear some fruit in future years in terms of motivating someone to pick up those bottles and collect some deposits on them. Yep, thank you very much. I've not seen any other indications. Is there anything you wanted to respond to? No? Okay. Okay, if, if we can then um, accept the recommended action on page 37 then. Agreed, thank you very much. Right. On to item 10, so the housing update and programme of works to council homes. Ms Wolfe, if you'd like to introduce. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an annual housing report for Housing Neighbourhoods and Leisure Committee. Uh, it provides an update on the performance of the housing service and key achievements over the last year. It also contains details of the extensive work programme to existing council homes planned over the next financial year and requests the relevant delegations to award the contracts for this work. As a service, we always try to ensure that tenants are kept at the heart of what we do. Therefore, it is pleasing to report the, pos the, the positive tenant satisfaction results with overall satisfaction at 82%. Um, satisfaction that the service makes a con positive contribution to neighbourhoods at 85% and that my landlord treats me fairly and with respect at 91%. We recognise that there is more to do around complaint handling. Although complaints amount to only 5% of tenants, this will be a priority area of focus over the next 12 months. The service continues to move forward, improving the thermal efficiency of homes, investing in excess of 26 million over the next two years in low carbon improvements, and tackling mould and damp is also a priority. Although the reported numbers are low, we do have a specialist team now set up to ensure that we keep on top of any problems. Finally, over the next year, we will continue with the delivery of, of new homes uh, with 15 key worker homes at Arthur Hill due to come on site shortly and also uh, 37 homes at North Street. Uh, following that, we will have further schemes that will deliver homes at Battle Street, Hexham Road, Amethyst Lane and Dwyer Road. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, my thanks go to the Assistant Director and the service. I think, you know, this is one of the reports we should all be proud of in terms of what is accomplished. You know, this is really important and life changing for many in the town and the key achievements speak for themselves in terms of the retrofit, the new heating systems that we've had going in, the delivery of new homes um, and success in supporting those that are struggling. And, you know, all of this is against a backdrop of a cost of living crisis. And we know that homelessness is really difficult and that's something that um, the housing team are mindful of and you know it's the holistic piece of work that goes on across the team to make sure that we can support people in relation to housing so hope colleagues have had a look at the program of works and what's going on in their patch um, the tenant survey is wonderful news as well and you know it, 
we do put tenants at the heart of what we do, as the assistant director said. Um, and I am sure that we will outperform housing associations locally. You know, a lot of my casework, the more severe casework comes from housing associations and the complete disregard. And the assistant director mentioned um, damp and mould, you know, in light of the Rochdale case and that work is really important. And we immediately wrote to all tenants in relation to damp and mould so that they knew how to get in touch if they were concerned and how um, we can assist them. And I know that we followed up on those that did get in touch, um, albeit it was a few, which is really pleasing because we know it is an issue in the town. I've seen it in private sector, as I say, and supported residents in taking them to the ombudsman. Um, and just to add that this is the first time that the complaints has tracked um, because that is now a requirement of the social housing white paper that came out. So I'm pleased to that that has come through in terms of the governance. And again, doubtless we perform some of the outperform some of the housing associations in that regard. But I'm really happy to see this report as ever. Um, and I hope the committee is minded to approve. So it gives us the delegation to get on with delivering all this wonderful stuff. Thank you, Councillor Emerson. Um, Councillor Creswell. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the report, very comprehensive. Um, I'd like to briefly note the irony in the survey that, that everything stayed the same or got better, apart from the question where people were asked if things had stayed the same or got better, where the number went down slightly, but not significantly. Um, my question is um, about the 59% of complaints um, responded to within the timescale. I was just wondering um, what's getting in the way. Yeah, I think we've had problems in so the, in terms of capacity across the teams, especially in our repair service. And so actually when the numbers come in on top of the members' inquiries, councils' inquiries, just inquiries from residents, it's just hard to keep on top of that. Uh, so what we're doing is we're monitoring really tightly. So as the complaint's coming in, who's responding to the complaint, uh, we've set some new timescales around that to give so that we don't, answer the complaints right at the last minute and I think that's part of the issues that people are juggling so many different things um, but as I said it's going to be an area of focus for us because we should you know we should be better. Thank you. Councillor, oh, did you want to come back on this point? Yeah, yeah just on that point, the other thing that I have said to the assistant director is we should also track compliments. Um, and I, I think we do do that, but not formally. And I think that's really important. I've, I think your point is quite well made in terms of making sure we do make that better. And the assistant director has answered that. But I just thought I'd add that in terms of complaints, because, you know, we do get a lot of compliments across the service and it helps to balance because obviously it's noted in the report that only 5% of tenants did make complaints um, in the last year. So I think looking at that, it would be really helpful. And having had this for the first time, it would be helpful to see it every year and then benchmark and look at it and see the improvement and yeah, where we need to go. I just thought I'd add that chair. Yep. Um, thanks. Yeah. From working in industry, complaints and compliments are often paired together and it is, is really very good to be on the receiving end of them from a motivating the team point of view. Yeah. It certainly is, but we're, gosh, human nature, isn't it, that we, we think about the complaints and we don't think of the compliments. We're very bad at giving compliments as well. Um, Councillor Lanzoni. Um, just a quick comment on this, really, because I think it was really interesting and I think um, I really appreciate the openness with which, you know, we also challenge ourselves on some aspect where uh, we can do better. Um, in Caversham, we have a high number of well, I don't know with respect to other words, but we've got a number of uh, council houses. And yes, I must admit that despite I can't compare with previous years because it's the first year I'm a councillor, uh, I'm aware of a number of residents which have got in touch with um, different issues regarding the sector and some have uh, may have gone down the route of making a formal complaint. Um, I wanted to share with everyone some reflections I've made and also share in the past weeks and months with um, also Zelda and, and Councillor Amberson. The first one is that still the number of inquiries and complaints around, I must say, our housing 
are potentially less than the complaint and emails we receive around the private sector. Uh, there are a number of issues in the private renting sector where um, you know we could potentially we are potentially doing much better than that. The second element I would point out to everyone when we consider the data for this year is that it's been very challenging. I've uh, found out uh, with respect to other years for two aspects. The first is uh, the season, which has been really challenging due to um, intermittent, very low temperature period with higher temperature, which has been destructive for um, uh, the, the, the houses. And these obviously must have contributed to the pressure on the team and obviously to the frustration of our residents, which may have decided to raise the complaint. The second element which I wouldn't have considered without being a counsellor is the difficulty we had nationwide as a market with procurement and the number of delayed um, well issues that have been uh, addressed or repaired with a delay because materials weren't simply or devices too. Sorry, I'm terrible at DIY. So apart from the language barrier of uh, English not being my first language, I think I wouldn't know anyway any kind of terminology around DIY. But the number of um, issues where the responses was that in the UK we simply couldn't get that particular piece or that particular elements that the team needed to address the uh, team was was surprising to me at, as well. So yes, I think uh, we should challenge ourselves regarding this number. We should also put them in the right perspective because from my personal experience this year again, I felt from the housing team a uh, extremely strong um, team and a lot of willingness in terms of accommodating the needs of our residents and trying to solve issues as fast as possible. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Mpufu Coles. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted just to uh, commend uh, Zelda and her team for acknowledging and also talking about how much they've had struggles about the repairs and other things and just being honest for us to look at the work they have done. And we also have to acknowledge the fact that there's been COVID and the backlog of repairs had been so immense. So trying to catch up on that and uh, I think complaints are really good thing in one way or the other. It improves services, it improves us, it keeps us on our toes to try as a council as a whole, including the opposition, to try and rectify things as much as possible. One of the things I've also noticed in my ward is that uh, there is officers or an officer in the area for housing that is directly linked and people locally know the, who is their housing officer so they can contact them directly on the telephone uh, uh, when they need to instead of going on the uh, local Reading Borough Council. So that's one of the things that is so important that they've improved on that again. And the other thing I wanted to mention is about damp and mold. I was horrified in the past few weeks when I went to several houses thinking running and thinking it was council houses when I saw the pictures and to find that these are private houses rented by people where there is mold and children. And as you know, um, damp and mold is a topical issue in the whole country uh, to mention. Uh, but how we are dealing with it in the council houses is, is, is far, far much a step ahead in trying to rectify those things before they get bad. But the damp and mold in private housing is really, really, really out of hand in most families who are desperately trying to live with their children and try and 
find places that are really suitable for them and it's affecting their children. So those are the things uh, just to commend the team uh, who, after all, have won some awards for the work they are doing in the housing and our, uh, the housing offices. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now have Councillor Singh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will start with a compliment. Uh, thank you, uh, Zelda, you, you, uh, you and your team does on this uh, important portfolio and congratulations for getting shortlisted for the awards. So uh, my question is uh, on, I have two questions, so I'll club them together. One is on 3.1 on complaints. So uh, thank you for, for, for the stats on that. How do you uh, capture complaints from the neighbors? From from the uh, from the tenants when you have complaints about noise issues, let's say from from the housing tenants or antisocial behavior or uh, how the garden or or the area is not maintained, how do you handle those kind of complaints and make sure it gets resolved for the community or, or the local area? Uh, if you have any numbers, that would be good to share. Second question is on uh, retrofitting time scales. Do we have any time scales? Do we have any issues with certain houses taking much longer uh, than other houses? Uh, and uh, on air heat pumps, uh, is how the tenants have been uh, advised to use it correctly? Because I understand they heat very slowly. It takes a lot of time. And in Kentwood, the houses are built in 1920 and all the uh, retrofitting work taking place, it should resolve it. And the noise of the air heat pumps, I think it has to be certain decibels of uh, 40 dB or around that. And the support you're getting on this air heat pumps from the manufacturer, I think in Mitsubishi or, you know, so they are the manufacturers. So are you getting right kind of support uh, or who is responsible? How the tenant should reach out to the manufacturer or to the housing tenant, you know, if you can add some. Thank you. <laughs> so far, I got it. I got it. In terms of uh, complaints uh, generally, so if there's complaints in the neighbourhood, we'd expect that to either come through on an inquiry or to come straight through uh, and be logged through the complaints team. If there are issues around antisocial behaviour or noise, we've got a, an app um, which we advertise to tenants where they can report the um, you know, whatever's happened and then we will get back and work through that complaint with them. Um, in terms of programmes of work, <laughs> Um, so we we so at this point in the year, then we'll be looking across the piece at all the programs of work that we need to deliver. Then we will look at what the procurement route would need to be to get the contractor in place. And then when we have once we have the contractor in place, then we'll work out what that time scale is. Um, with uh, large programs of work, it can uh, it differs. Um, you know, we have had issues with getting contractors on board and issues in terms of contractors having uh, long lead in periods for materials. So um, that is going that is probably still going to be a factor for us um, over the coming year. But we, we do our best to kind of work through with that um, in terms of air source heat pumps. So, yes, it's new technology. Um, we use our sustainable homes officers to provide education and advice to tenants. Um, so the first set that we did were in um, Granville Road. Um, and we set up a, a test flat so that whilst they were being installed, that residents could come along and learn how to use them effectively. Um, and we also made sure that we put in uh, digital thermometers on the walls so that they can see what the temperature is. Because I think one of the issues with air source heat pumps is that people expect their radiators to get as hot as they used to, um, and they don't. But seeing the temperature dial enables the resident to realise that the flat is actually uh, at the right at the right temperature. We will be doing some more work uh, with tenants on this. Um, what we want to do is to be able to track how efficient the air source heat pumps are over a period of time. So going back and then checking uh, on their ability to use it, but also how cost effective it has um, been for them. Um, I can't remember the last part of your, there's one, 
Oh, oh yes. So it's the yes. If they have an issue with it, then they need to contact the housing team, not the manufacturer. Come through the housing team, uh, and then we'll deal with it. If there is a, a defect on it, um, they're all under warranty. So then we will be responsible for calling the manufacturer in. Um, Councillor Ayub. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to congratulate uh, Zelda on this report and it's in a fine details. Uh, uh, I just want to ask a question uh, uh, around the complaints. You, you received 275 complaints and uh, you've given a percentage out. You know, the complaints which were not upheld are 71. 26%. That seems quite large number uh, of complaints. It is, uh, uh, can you give a bit of a clarification why uh, these were not upheld? Because uh, I might have missed something in between there. So the majority of the complaints were upheld and what we found is in terms of looking at the different uh, or the themes that come out of that, a lot of that is about failure to resolve issues and communication. So uh, and often they involve more than one team. Um, so for instance, if we have uh, a complaint, so Repairs is one of the areas where we will tend to get quite a large number of complaints. So if a tradesman goes out and can't fix the item at that point in time, maybe has to order a part and then it takes time for the, the part to arrive. And then we'll find that our communication between when the tradesman went in and when the part arrives is less than perfect. So the tenants left wondering, when am I going to get that repair done? I was told I was going to get a repair. And there's a reason why it hasn't happened, but we need to be better at keeping in, uh, in uh, contact with the residents so that they understand what the time scales are going to be and if it's delayed, why it's been delayed. And sometimes you'll get complaints which will be repairs focused, but it will also be about the neighbourhood or it might be about uh, a neighbour at the same time. So kind of, so within that, you might find something that you will uphold because we've, we've been at fault and other items where we, we wouldn't uh, uphold it because actually we have got it right. Sometimes we have policy issues, so people might complain that they've been on the housing register for a long time and they haven't got a house. But we can't do very much about that because we've got an allocation scheme and we work through that on the basis of the properties that are available. So under those circumstances, we can't uphold the complaint because there isn't anything that we could do about that. I don't know if, th if that covers what you wanted. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Connell. Thank you. Um, and thank you for such an excellent comprehensive uh, report. Um, first off, I've I got, got to say, I think complaints are a really good thing for any organisation. I think we should welcome them with open arms and, and have as many as possible because it allows us to improve our services and see where we're going wrong. And as an organisation, I'm really, really pleased that we are getting these complaints um, and looking at them and drilling into them and, you know, finding ways to be an even better landlord. Um, but it's great that we're doing so well at it. You know, those percentages, you know, of satisfaction are, are, are superb. Um, my question also um, was around uh, the sort of ground source heat pumps and the improved double glazing, which is something I think is fantastic. Um, it's great for the environment, but it's got the knock on effect in a cost of living crisis. Um, I'm presuming of reducing costs for those residents. Are we keeping any kind of figures? Because we might in time want to look back on that and reflect on how our improvements are actually saving individuals money, you know, at a time when by heck they need to save money. And and I think, you know, Reading Borough Council should be patted on the back for any savings that we are bringing to our residents and helping to make things easier. So that's, that's one thing. Could we perhaps collect some kind of data on what their costs were prior 
to the ground source heat pumps, the improved double glazing, well, triple glazing, whatever we're putting in, and then look at it perhaps a year later and be able to say to ourselves, wow, you know, this is great. You know, the credit where credit is due. Um, also, anecdotally, I, I have heard, you know, from tradespeople um, and uh, people who own their own homes that um, prices for materials are, have gone up massively. Um, whether Brexit, cost of living, coronavirus, who knows? Um, but things like the glass, I've particularly heard the cost of actual panes of glass is, is much more than it used to be. Is this happening for the council? Are these costs going up? And is it going to have an impact on our timescales to continue to improve our housing stock and bring these benefits to our residents of, you know, the improved heating, but also, you know, lower costs? Thank you. Yeah, yeah so we are looking at how we can uh, show the um, reduction in bills for, for tenants. Uh, it's quite difficult because it's uh, it depends on tenants wanting to share that information with you because we don't have a way of being able to monitor it that remotely. Um, so we will be looking at setting, working with maybe just a group, of, a small select group of people so that we can, we can track that. I think this year isn't a particularly great year because of the energy costs rising. So any savings that they may have anticipated that they would make probably wouldn't have um, followed through. So I think our intention is to start looking at that later in the year. So maybe get through to the spring and then start to track things in the hope that, you know, the, the national picture or the world picture as it is with cost of living kind of starts to get better. Um, in terms of the uh, leading time, so materials, cost of materials, that is an issue. Uh, it, it certainly is an issue. So when we um, have tendered programmes of work over the last year, they've all come back significantly more expensive than what we uh, anticipated. Um, I think the supply side is starting to get a little bit better. So hopefully we won't struggle with that. Uh, we This year we will be looking at starting work on our three high-rise tower blocks in Wensley, where we'll be um, in the Coley, I should say, where we're replacing the external fabric uh, and the windows there. So we'll be really, you know, hoping that we won't have significant delays around that. But that will be the test, really, because it will be a lot of windows that will be be, be changing. Thank you. I have got Councillor Woodward. Thank you very much. Um, very pleased to to receive this report because um, I my my ward church ward is in South Reading, where a huge number of uh, of houses are uh, are in, a part of the council stock. And I have to say that my experience of um, getting stuff done, you know, when um, residents come to me about uh, things like repairs and so on, is very good. Stuff gets sorted and it gets sorted quickly. And everything this report saying. It's going in. It's it's going in the right direction. So I'm I'm very happy that we, that that our council house stock is in good hands. Um, I mean, I just make a general point about council housing. Is how important it is. Now this 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 side of the chamber wants to build more council housing, much much more. Um, we build it everywhere everywhere we could, and we do that because you just have to look at the private sector. The private rented sector, just in comparison. People want a safe place, a secure place, decent decent bricks and mortar and a, a decent rent. And I, I speak as somebody who was literally born and brought up in council housing, and I'm not going to say it never did me any harm, but I'm, I'm going to say it did me a lot of good, actually. It was being brought up in a village. And, um, and I want that extended. I want more and more people to understand what that means and how safe and secure that can be. And while we're here, I mean, we've got, we've only got one representative from the governing party here. Um, and I hope you don't think I'm picking on you, Councillor Singh, because, but there's not that many of you these days. So, you know, you've got to take your opportunities when they're, <coughs> when they're presented to you. But I would urge you to contact your comrades in um, Parliament oh. and in, <laughs> I use the word <laughs> and in, in number 10 and remind them that asking questions like what are you doing with all our council house receipts? 
Let's have our council receipts. Let's have our money back for a start. And why aren't they building more councils? Why aren't they encouraging local authorities like this one to build more and more councils? They used to. The Macmillan government was very good at building council houses. They seem to have lost the knack somehow. Something to do with Thatcher and something, you know, shoring up her political base. I Something like that, anyway. But I urge you, Councillor C, please talk to your, to your sorry, I won't call them comrades, your mates. <laughs> in, in high places. Get them to reconsider, because this is the kind of house and Reading is leading the way in council housing and showing what can be done with proper social housing. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Councillor Woodwin. It's important to remember that um, when a council department receives a complaint, there's no, not going to be a revenge eviction there. The person's not going to be scared about losing their home because they've complained about the mould or the windows or the doors. We're in the private rented sector. They don't have that privilege. And I know it's happening in this town. I've heard it as a school governor. Uh, Councillor and Poofa Coles, again, last question for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, there's something that I wanted to, to just find out quickly from Zelda on the special adaptations, because in weekly ward we've got dis a lot of disabled and elderly people. Uh, you said the area of work is very reactive. Uh, could you explain more? Because those are the kind of, of things that we, we do get when the elderly and the disabled are saying they are waiting. Uh, for that and you're saying it's very reactive. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we have a budget each year for uh, adaptations uh, and the way that it works is that when uh, somebody uh, expresses a need for an adaptation, we have a specialist housing OT who will go out and uh, and assess their need and then look at what we can put in place. A significant number of those adaptations that we do are for elderly people. Often it's uh, level access showers uh, that we're putting into properties. We will be um, putting in place uh, over the course of the next year, we've got a new IT system coming and we'll be creating uh, an adapted housing register, which is just for people who have uh, a disability or people who are frail elderly and need a adaptation to their home. Um, and then we will be able to put the properties alongside that so that th those properties that we have that are adapted or those that are capable of being adapted will only be advertised to, to those people. Um, in addition to that, we do in terms of the new build properties so we for every new build site that we get we look at what we can do from a proactive point of view in terms of putting properties in place that lend themselves to people with a with a disability thank you really important question um i can't see anyone else indicating so can we move to approve the recommended action on page 44 thank you Right then, on to agenda item 11, and this is the Environment Act 2021 Waste Management. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess everyone's aware of the Environment Act by now. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the three main limbs which relate to waste management. Um, obviously it covers lots of other things, river, air quality, all sorts of things, but we're just going to deal with the waste management tonight. There are three main limbs within it that relate to waste. Extended producer responsibility. Um, that's going to bring in the principle of producer pays, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, producers of packaging will pay fees. Those fees will be modulated on the damage that their packaging uh, may do to the environment. So they'll pay more if they're producing more damaging packaging. Um, those payments will be passed down or some of them will be passed down to councils to cover the cost of managing the waste that that packaging becomes and that's a change obviously waste collection and waste management um, have, have always normally been uh, paid for through taxation central taxation at councils so along with that those payments will come a new regime um, which will require councils to offer services which are particularly in respect of collection, which are both efficient and effective, and that will be judged um, independently. Um, benchmarking will take place. Councils will be placed in cohorts of like councils. Um, we don't know the specific criteria yet, um, but councils will be in the cohort. There'll be a best in class council and everyone else will be judged against that best in class and payments will be impacted by your position within that cohort. So um 
cost of service, uh, recycling rates, all those sorts of things, and many other uh, indicators will be used. If you're not the best in class, there's a good chance you'll be presented with an improvement notice and the improvement notice may give indication of the reduction in funding you'll receive if you don't achieve the objective set out in the improvement notice. So that's extended producer responsibility. That's the first part. The second part is a deposit return scheme. Um, and that is the most the one that has been most recently uh, announced uh, in January this year. That's going to cover very specific types of recyclable material, PET, um, clear plastic bottles, aluminium and, and steel drinks containers, cans, basically tins, they're, all, they're covered. Not milk bottles, not glass bottles, um, just those three. The way it's going to work, I, I guess people are probably fairly familiar. Um, people of a certain age go back to Corona bottles at this point and, and sort of get quite misty eyed about it all. Um, there's going to be a 20p deposit applied to every single item. Um, we think we've had it confirmed, almost certain, that it will also apply to multi-pack items as well. So it won't be one 20p deposit for a 12 pack of Coke. It will be 12 lots of 20p. So that's DRS. Waste collection consistency is the final one and that's going to require councils to work to three specific uh, service archetypes which will which will be designed and are designed and they're in the report for you to see um, at 4.26. Um, we in, in, in Reading uh, really in terms of uh, complying with that we just need to collect glass and plastic film that sounds just need to collect those things but we, we're actually a long way down that and a long a long way further ahead than, than some councils you've got a lot more to do so in a way that's really good news for us um, uh, there'll be a, an assessment a TEEP assessment which is a technical technical um, economic and environmental um, practicability test which we will be able to apply if we wish to remove move away from those archetypes um, and again this will link back to the EPR and our payments that we receive and then the, the big one um, is that the government may mandate the free collection of garden waste which um, is a service um, obviously um, which many councils charge for on the basis that if you have a nice garden and you like gardening and you have waste that comes from that garden and it helps you enjoy that garden, it's fair for you to pay for the collection of that waste. Um, the government's looking at two options. It's, I think, uh, one which is free and another which is a reasonable uh, charge, um, which may be somewhere around the 35, sort of half half the cost of, of what most councils are charging, 35 pounds. The report goes on to talk about some impacts and I'll just go through this very quickly. I think it seems likely there'll be a squeeze on funding um, because government and, and uh, has designed and the packaging producers will not want to pay for what a council's prevailing costs are. They will pay what the, the sort of cohort model tells them. There's a big question mark, as I say in the report, around the equality impact of DRS. There's no mention of elderly residents. There's there's one mention in the impact assessment of disabled of disability being a factor that they must must consider, but there are no, and it seems impossible that there can be really many steps they can take to help disabled people to redeem those 20 p's back that that they will be charged at the point of sale. So that's quite difficult. There will obviously be a high co higher cost to consumers, and we give some indications of those. Um, costs in the report. It's interesting to note that Scotland, which is um, ahead of, of the rest of, of, of the country on this, was proposing to introduce DRS in August and the SNP candidates for the leadership at the moment have all said they would pause it basically on that, on those grounds, I think, on, on cost grounds. Um, there are some opportunities, so I don't want to be all doom and gloom. I think there are lots of opportunities out of the Environment Act for councils, and I give some of those at the end of the report. But rather than me banging on for ages, Chair, probably best if anyone's got any questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer any questions. I'll go to Councillor Rowland first, and then I've got um, Councillor Barnett Ward. Um, thank you, Chair, and I thank um, uh, Oliver Burt for his um, 
full report, which um, I I heard some exclamations going up um, um, that that um, people across the way hadn't even really clocked some of these things, and they are they are somewhat difficult to to clock all of the potential changes, and indeed some of the impacts uh, financially. So. Uh, you know, with the possibility for um, for residents to no longer have to pay for their um, garden waste, for example, that alone could wind up costing Reading Borough Council 950k a year. So, um, you know, th those are those are some of the real impacts, and and um, Oliver's done again an excellent job in in outlining them. Um, clearly, we are uh, in. I, I feel in a very good good stead uh, with the majority of the items that we will be uh, required to recycle because, really, by and large, we we are already there and already have very robust uh, systems for that collection. Um, what we will be looking to bring on board when we receive further guidance, and the guidance is still to come is um, insofar as glass recycling and then also the 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 plastic wrap kind of uh, that that soft plastic kind of uh, recycling. So those will be the plastic film. Uh, those those will be issues that we'll have to be dealing with. Uh, and again, uh, you know, the cost could the cost could be there. The extended producer responsibility. Uh, yes. Well, unless we're best in class um, could be could be um, uh, a little bit of an argy bargy, I guess, as to how much funding we could wind up uh, with on uh, based on an improvement uh, requires improvement uh, situation, how well we were how well we achieve that and I guess how much money we'll be able to get. I, I don't I, you know it's kind of a little bit a little bit dodgy there, but uh, I have to say at the uh, last um, RE3 board meeting, which I attended along with Councillor Page last week, uh, unanimously uh, through with Wokingham and also with Bracknell Forest, uh, all three councils uh, are putting together a letter to uh, the government to ask them to actually um, rethink this this kind of structure that uh, it may not be the most positive way forward and may not actually elicit the most positive results. Um, the um, the situation with the deposit return scheme, um, you know, yes, uh, Scotland is is kind of real back on that, uh, and I'm hoping others might chime in about that. But I do want to also uh, also discuss in return in in situation with the deposit return scheme, how unfair that really can be. Uh, I saw eyebrows go up when it was like 20p for, you know, your your carton of this or that and each one of those. Yes, it, it will rack up and that is a cost that everyone will have to pay. But you think about your disabled persons uh, in your communities, your elderly persons in the community that cannot get that, that are not so easily capable of getting that return back. They can't really just get that to the store. And so that reduce that has a lot of complexities, and it's something that that we've already uh, had discussions with last week, uh, with the early early discussions with the disabled access working group, uh, because that's very concerning. Something that's very concerning to them. So um, you know, I'm, I'm with, <laughs> not to repeat a lot of what Oliver said. Yes, there there is a lot of potentially. Uh, news or potential news that that may impact this council uh, very tremendously uh, financially. And um, so we need to, you know, we need to be mindful of that. And um, the budget going forward has reflected those those um, those ongoing uh, concerns that we might have that these that these might indeed come forward uh, some of these costs. So the um, good thing is, is our positives. The good thing is, is the positive response and the, the cooperation we have with the RE3 board currently that all three councils are working really together, uh, really well together. We're being very proactive, uh, talking about some really great innovative uh, ways that we can look at further recycling and further improvements. So I would say we've got a really positive can-do attitude, but there will be uh, obviously these issues coming down and we will be awaiting further instruction and um, hoping that the impact will be um, something that's not too grave on the council and will benefit ultimately 
benefit us all and the environment. Thank you. Thank and obviously the costs are disproportionately unfair. If you can't afford a tin of beans now, you can't afford a tin of beans with extra 20p thrown on top. Um, so those with the lowest incomes will be most impacted by these price rises. Yeah. Councillor Barnett Ward. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we were waiting for this document back when I was the lead with the responsibility for waste management. So I suppose I should be saying it's good that we've got it, but actually there's so many problems within it. I'm not sure it was. We might have been better when we were just waiting. Um, I want to zero in on the deposit return scheme. Um, as stated, it is disproportionate to uh, the impact it will have on residents. I was really pleased to see the stuff in there about suggesting reverse spending via the councils or a curbside recycling. But of course, that will perforce need the use of, of smartphones or other computers in order to do that. So still um, older people, uh, people with certain disabilities will be excluded from that scheme and won't be able to use it. Uh, but what I really wanted to, to look at was the impact on small businesses of having the deposit return scheme. And this was something that was discussed and raised with the Scottish scheme. So I foolishly, as it turned out, hope that that would have been addressed when our proposals came forward. To have the deposit return scheme, if they're going to do something like the Scottish proposal, that was going to be done through barcodes um, on the, the items that are being recycled. So in this case, cans. And because we're in Reading, let's talk about beer cans. So if you're Heineken and you are doing the same type of beer, I don't know how much they do of it, year on, year out, you have sought out one barcode and you put that on every can of beer that you sell. If you are, for example, from my ward, Banton Brewery, or if you're double barreled, or if you're any of our small batch craft brewers that we have in Reading, every time they do a new beer, they will have to register that beer, get a distinct uh, barcode or other way of identifying it for that, pay for that process, and then restart over and over again. So not only does the cost of this fall disproportionately on residents, it also on small manufacturers. And there seems to be nothing so far that shows that the government have, have noticed or addressed this. So I am deeply worried about what this could do to our local small businesses. And I think the whole idea of deposit return scheme is one of those things where it sounds good, but the devil is in the detail. And when you start looking at it, it becomes unworkable and possibly ineffective. Councillor Cresswell said that maybe deposit return scheme would help with plastic bottles at Reading Festival site. There is a deposit return scheme at Reading Festival site. Every plastic bottle sold on Reading Festival grounds within Festival Republic sellers has a 20p deposit on it. And they were still just being dropped and not returned. Um, I think it's one of those things that people think this is the way we'll sort it. And I, the more I read about it, the more I learn about the practicalities, the less keen I am on it, quite frankly. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cresswell. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I can see the concerns about the deposit return scheme and um, I, I, I have the expectation that it, that there are problems with it, but it does work well elsewhere. It works very well in Canada um, and it, it is going to make people's first shop in the scheme more expensive and that's a real issue. Beyond that, once it's in train, then people have got to take their empties back to the shop and there's no, it's net zero in terms of cost beyond that. But that, for many people, that first iteration is going to be um, tricky, which brings me on to my main question, which is about the whole change process here, which is quite a lot of change for us as a council. And um, is that change process funded by the government in any way? And does it leave us with any contractual problems in terms of people who are expecting waste from us who may not get it anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some of the change, some of the costs of change are likely to be funded. We don't know yet. We we're awaiting an, an announcement which we expect to be before the end of the calendar year. Um, so we we expect there will be some funding, but I think it's inevitable that it will be on the same sort of principle as I described before, which is a certain number of pence in the pound. Uh, that's not how it's been announced, but I don't think it will be full 
change it will, it will cover the full cost of transition and in a way how could it because every single council is slightly different in the way that they're doing they're all changing in sli some slight way so the way that they're approaching it is rather to do it on a on the basis of a kind of um, formula which they'll apply to a cohort the cohort will be based on the kind of nearest neighbor principles which of course you know broadly speaking always works but if you look at any nearest neighbor cohort there are some people in there that you just go how the heck are they like us or um so i'm not expecting it to be perfect um in terms of um the second part of the question which was around if you can just remind me apologies <laughs> um just reading the report there seemed to be a hint that that we may have a contractor who would be expecting some waste from us and that that would be the, mo the motivation for the curbside scanning apologies yes i mean that is a really big point um it's going to take away material that through our current contract and indeed if we had a, a contract for collection it would be a familiar clause in that contract as well which says you want us the provider to deal with all of this stuff and you're going to tell us how much of that stuff there is how many cans plastic whatever um this is basically just lifting those out of that contract and dropping them into someone else's arrangements so of course the contractors across the country for all councils in this situation will be saying well it says here you're going to give me this material change in law means i'm i'm able to able to claim either relief or compensation for the material you're now not going to be giving me now even if that isn't the case it's going to take councils time and effort legal advice financial advice we're going to have to sit down with our contractors and talk about it um you know and if i'm honest they are under no obligation to let us off we've signed a contract our contract is sponsored by defra defra has written this legislation turning effectively a blind eye at the moment there may be something that comes out which says don't worry we're going to we're going to take this problem away from you but at the moment we don't know how that's going to be dealt with so it's a very good question and um that's the situation as we see it at the moment yeah thank you i suppose there's also the difficulty that if you obviously do take the hit the first time this is an assumption that you can go back and reclaim that 20p if you're experiencing multiple deprivations for example mental health difficulties difficulties of the executive functioning that process will be difficult and we need to understand that not everybody is able to have that kind of organization in their life especially when things are difficult as they are right now no no not everyone can do that exactly i have um councillor o'connell Thank you. Um, I, I, I do see and acknowledge uh, the difficulties for um, certain groups within society with the deposit return scheme. However, I, I just, we have to um, tackle the uh, climate emergency. There, there isn't actually an option left for society. And if we don't do this now, we're just kicking the plastic can down the road. Um, and what is sad to me is it does sound as though the government are making a pig's ear about doing something that needs to be done and should be done well. Um, and and I, you know, regret the situation that the council's in. Um, in many ways, listening to everybody tonight, you know, it's it's incredibly sad that we don't live in a society uh, that that works in a more holistic way to tackle the big issues but rather what i'm hearing is that uh, uh, services and local authorities are being sort of pitted against each other to, to have to fight and compete uh, to try to find the money to cover these things without having to yet again put upon the residents who we know are under so much stress so it, 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 Yes, I, I think it's absolutely inevitable. We have to do these things. I too have seen the uh, deposit return scheme working brilliantly. Um, my sister lives in uh, Germany, married to a German, and they've done the cultural shift. So it's become a habit in the same way that with, you know, 5P plastic bags, you know, at first we we all forgot them and, you know, moaned and grumbled about it. But now we're all in the habit of sticking a bag in our bags and, you know, it's a cultural shift and we will get to that stage. With, I, I'm, I'm sure of it because other countries have and I don't see any reason why British people would be worse at it than uh 
Canadians or Germans or anyone else. So I, I know we'll get that. I am sorry that, you know, we're not being given perhaps the funding to be able to properly address the issues of access for people with disabilities or, or limited car use. And I do recognise that it is going to hurt those. I, I don't know what we're going to do about it, but I'm, I'm happy to sort of put my thinking cap on the same as the rest of you and just see if we can't do something for Reading. Um, I also uh, wanted to make a comment about the uh, free collections for garden waste. Um, I know we weren't the worst when we started charging, but I, I was enormously regretful that we had to move that way. Um, and I'm not sorry um, that we might be uh, reducing those costs uh, for residents, um, even though I know it's going to lose us money um, because the mental and physical benefits to people's well-being are huge. You know, the people who spend a lot of time in their gardens, and you said about these big gardens, some of us have postage stamps, and yet the flowers, you know, that grow in the little bit of border that I have bring me such enormous pleasure um, and and do lift my my men mental health. And, and I know people who work on even smaller areas of garden for whom, you know, that that's massive. They might not have the finances to be able to access other forms of exercise or the mobility to access other forms of exercise so that that garden area can be so essential so in the long run we might see some big savings to health services um but that doesn't come out of our budget so i kind of come back to my point again of us being pitted against other services they might see a benefit in their finances to us um, reducing the costs or even getting rid of the costs of uh, the garden waste collections but yet again reading borough council and our residents being hit by it kind of not sure what my question is in all of that it, it Thank you for the work you're doing. And I suppose I'm saying, you know, we see just the struggles that, that you're trying to balance here. And thank you for trying to do your best by Reading residents. Thank you. I've got um, Councillor Cross. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm hopeful that progress will swiftly be made as someone who's been um, calling for curbside glass recycling to be introduced. It's very frustrating that the um, uncertainty on the government's part has has delayed the council's ability to progress with that. My question is with regards to the deposit return scheme and the waste collection consistency standard. One of the things has been that the potential interaction between those and the impacts between one and the other has meant that delays in the formulation of one scheme has had impact on the other. And my question is, do we expect these schemes to be introduced in tandem? And do potential delays of the deposit return scheme, as we've seen in Scotland, potentially delay the implementation of the waste collection standards? At the moment, um, at the moment, the DRS is sort of slated for 2025 and the waste collection consistency is 2026. So I think the assumption we can take is that no, there's not necessarily a link between the two. However, if one was delayed, it's possible that the other might be delayed. The, the, the difficulty I think for us is that councils will be required to collect, still collect those items which will be covered by the DRS. So in a way, there's no financial saving. If we could turn a little bit of the collection off, not that we might choose to, but 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 we won't be able to because we will still be required to offer that service to everyone. In fact, we'll be mandated to, to, to do that. So perhaps I'm talking myself around to saying, no, I don't think there's a particular link. Um, although we must await the final announcement of the waste collection consistency requirements that we're going to they're going to be placed on us so until really i can't answer until we get those i suppose but there shouldn't need to be a link thank you councillor cresswell uh thank you very quick comment on the drs uh, i can see everyone's worried about how vulnerable people might work with this and i work with vulnerable people quite a lot um 
and my, my comment would be that the empties are lighter and smaller than the original shopping so um, however they got their food in the first place would provide a route to um, getting the deposits back but my question is about um, this may sound flippant but I think I think that will cover a lot of the um, the perceived um, difficulties um, my question is about food banks actually and is in the in the plans is there a, any mention of how the DRS will interact with food banks no it's not mentioned at all um, uh, unfortunately I, I mean I should stress just linked to this question it sort of gives me an opportunity to say there could be a rational and fantastic answer to all of these issues it's just that it has already been announced we're doing it and we don't know what those answers are so both in terms of food waste in terms of equality issues um councillor Rowland talks about the letter that we're writing the letter will ask for the publish for the equality impact assessment to be published if one exists it must exist but um we just don't know so i must leave the door open to, for there to be a wonderful answer to all of these things we just don't have it right now yeah thank you councillor barnett ward uh thank you for letting me come back in chair um oliver back when i was lead i remember saying to you how does this how has the government thought about how this is going to work for people who have their shopping delivered? And this is the point that I'm trying to make is that not everybody goes to the shop. A lot of people have their shopping delivered and then they put their recycling and the recycling bins at home and they never carry it anywhere. Now, at that time, um, it seemed to be complete news to the to the government that people do have their shopping delivered. Um, <laughs> by Tesco. Um, has there been any awareness of that? Because actually a solution there could be that Tesco or whoever have to take your empties and do a reverse spend themselves. And that would solve from when I'm thinking about my service users in my day job who are all visually impaired, many of them are a lot older, they don't have access to smartphones and so on. They do tend to get their shopping delivered and actually that would work for them. But there's likely to need to be some level of compulsion. And is there any uh, acknowledgement uh, that you can see from the government that they have found out that people get their shopping delivered? It's certainly been talked about. Um, there's a trial on the, uh, at the moment in Wales on what's called a digital DRS, which would allow people to scan their own. And I think Councillor Rowland, you mentioned that earlier. Sorry, Councillor Barnett, would you mention that earlier yourself about the fact that that would actually be a different type of perhaps potential inequality if you don't, you know, or find it very easy to use your phone or whatever. Um, but there are, there have been discussions around um, online shopping and deliveries being taken back by at the point that you get your next delivery, for example. Um, there doesn't seem at the moment, I can't speak for them, doesn't seem to be a great deal of enthusiasm for that from the um, from the people doing the delivery, because of course, I suppose in the van, they've also got people's new shopping that they don't want to get mixed up and covered with all the residue from anyway. Um, so we, we wait and see. But again, that could be one of the one of the, the ways they go. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly on this, uh, I believe there's a lot of unknowns and ambiguity still on, on this. And uh, as this will be rolled out in 25 and 26, I'm assuming this would be piloted first, not rolled out across the country, and then it would be adopted across you know, uh, uh, the country. Is that, are you aware of this or uh, how this is going to be rolled out? The plan at the moment, as far as we know, is that it's going to be a kind of hard launch. It's just going to be starting in, in and, and for councils, I suppose. Um, there's been a lot of work going on in the background, but I, I don't think there are going to be some kind of pilot uh, trials for waste collection consistency or DRS or anything like that. I think basically it's going to be there's a hard date. That date may slip, but I think at the moment it's just the expectation that that's when it will start. And I suppose from a point of view of what do we want to call it, m getting momentum and making it work as a, as a nation, it, it's almost got to work like that really on quite a large scale. Thank you. Another one for your list there, Councillor Singh, to take back to your friends. Um, right, and then comrades. Um, OK, I can't see more indications. So can we move to approve the recommended action on page 65? Excellent. On to our final item then, and that is the Highway Maintenance Programme 23-24 and 22-23 Highway Maintenance Update. 
welcome, Mr. Sheen. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the report before you is an annual report we bring to committee, and this provides a progress on the 22-23, the last financial year's capital delivery program. Uh, but it also serves as our grant determination for the DFT for the funding that they give us annually. Uh, the Council's carried out, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the Council's carried out extensive highway works programs during the past financial year, including major road resurfacing, specialist carriage resurfacing of concrete roads, minor residential roads resurfacing, pavement resurfacing, street lighted LED replacement programs, as well as extensive bridges structural maintenance program. Uh, to date, we've um, surfaced over 491 roads um, and with our latest major roads tender that's part of this pack cam has come back today. We expect to do a further 40 to 50 roads in the coming weeks, taking us well over the 500 roads we surfaced so far. Um, one of the uh, biggest uh, improvements in our road condition indicators is around the residential roads, where prior to 2020, we had a 35% of our network in green overall uh, condition. Uh, they're now over 77 percent and we expect this to con continue to rise in the coming years. Um, pothole numbers and have fallen dramatically as have complaints around potholes. Um, I can say that the conversation of potholes is not in Reading anymore, which is fantastic. Um, the continued investment from the council with a further eight million pound over the next five years will continue to improve our roads, our carriage rates, our pavements, further reduce potholes and complaints, reduce the risk to the council further, and then and then also allow the council to use lower carbon alternatives to extend the life of the road rather than resurfacing the road. So we're looking at uh, cheaper, uh, longer um, alternatives that can add life to um, our assets. Uh, it's a kind of funding that's allowed us to do this. Um, another indicator we've shown we're in the right trajectory is the annual National Highways and Transportation Mori Resident Satisfaction Survey of last year. Uh, where the indicators show that um, we're above average, national average on 141 of the indicators, and we're showing an improvement in 90 with the biggest improvement coming in the, uh, on how we're dealing with potholes and uh, damaged roads, which is good news. Uh, the report also sets out the proposal to commit future, uh, the capital funding rather for next financial year, 23-24, uh, which will continue to improve one of Reading's most valuable assets, which is the public highway. I would ask the committee to approve the recommendations set out in section two. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to remind everyone on the committee, this is not casework time for your potholes. No, this is higher level than that. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Even though you took my line there, uh, yes, no ward work, uh, but indeed. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Sam Sheen for uh, another very excellent report, very thorough report, uh, lays out what has been accomplished, which I think is something that I'm certainly, I know along with my colleagues uh, on this side of the room, extremely, extremely proud of the investment that we have made uh, through through capital funding uh, in our roads to ensure that everybody can share in the success of Reading, that, that, we've, uh, that we've now uh, improved 500 roads. Uh, and counting and building on and on uh, pathways. Uh, I always look at Sam and smile because he also, you know, became very innovative when we were starting to work on pathways and said, gee, we can put trees by these pathways. Great, good. <laughs> you know, this was, this was uh, uh, bang on good stuff. So, I mean, basically this, this is um, talking about something that, that is a really a great success. Uh, You've got a hardworking team, a really dedicated team, a really smart team, uh, and you're constantly innovating and uh, saving money and being able to even bring more roads into in, into the scheme. Uh, so it is it's it's really basically a a very good news story. I'm also delighted to uh, to. Uh, see the information about. Well, I, I do. I do know about this. But the the uh, bridges and structural improvements and the other uh, five year rolling plan for uh, improvements on those structural assets. Um, so that's that's really really good and shows that we are continuing to ensure that our our roads our structures are really top notch for this town and uh, the the just the difference I know. And I don't really drive. I do more walking and all that, and I'm rarely in I'm rarely in a car as often. But but 
you notice the difference uh, these days when you're driving down your roads in Reading Mere. And uh, so that's that's what we're talking about. And uh, I, I'd like to thank the team very much for all the work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I've not seen any. Oh, any, any, yeah, okay, Councillor O'Connell. It's, it's actually a slight aside because we're not allowed to bring up ward work. Um, <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's a total aside. I just wanted to say thank you and can you pass on my thanks to your team for the uh, gritting that you did prior to the snows this week. Um, it did. Sadly, I was able to get into work and the school wasn't shut. No, I, I felt really safe going out on the roads. Your guys had gone out and covered everything and just thank you ever so much. It's nice to know that when we get hit with this stuff, you're there ahead of the snow. My children were gutted. Uh, Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you for the report, uh, Sam, and thank you, your team, uh, always, you know, very responsive and uh, resolve queries. So thank you for that. Uh, my question is on uh, 4.8 overall uh, satisfaction, 77 percent. I, I need to know what of what number, because I get lost in percentages when you say 77 percent. Is it out of 10 people or is it out of three people? So uh, is there a number? Do we have a number? Uh, how many people were surveyed? I, I, I will. Make sure, but I, I believe that there's uh, more than a thousand that are on the Reading Borough Council Saturday survey where that figure comes from. Yeah. The Maury survey, which is the national high one, we go out to 3,300 homes in Reading. Um, the percentage returns is about 23%, but we have a good um, cross section for the Maury and also the, the resident survey. So they're both, both of those surveys Perfect. are combined. Perfect, thank you. And my second question was uh, around the scanners you use uh, 4.12. Uh, assessing the roads before uh, resurfacing. Uh, uh, my, uh, my question is around once the road is resurfaced, how do we inspect that and how do we resolve the remedial work? Are we using same scanners to do that? <coughs> and what is the turnaround time once the remedial work is identified on the resurfaced work by the uh, contractors? I can answer that just on the on the maintenance schedule. Um, the contractors have a two year maintenance period yeah. um, and defects are picked up. I mean, they, they're usually on the main roads anyway, and our highway inspectors travel on the main roads every day to go to other roads. So any defect that they pick up will be reported back to the engineering team and it goes back to the contractor. We hold a two and a half percent um, retention. And when you're doing a, a five million pound contract, the substantial amount of money that we hold uh, to entice them to, to come back. Um, with the scanner surveys, they, they carried out annually, but they carried out at different seasons of the year each time. So you get winter, spring, summer, um, autumn. Um, so there are a, a rolling program. The, the the data from the scanner come is used over two years. So what the scanner scanners will do, they go in one direction one year and they come back uh, in the following direction the second year. So they can cover the full width of the wider carriageways. Um, and it is a um, electronic device that that will be collecting data along the way so it's over two years make up the indicator but what happens is it provides us um, a, 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 an agreed system through a paper management system that actually gives us the priority so we'll have a list of 100 to, to 500 roads in order of priority of which ones we have to deal with um, which which actually sets our program so, so uh, my question was around once the road is resurfaced and we go and do a visual inspection or whatever and find a list of remedial work where you know it was not done correctly uh, and it needs to be fixed otherwise uh, you know, it can deteriorate the whole road and you know uh, put put everything uh, at risk so what's the time scale for those remedial work to be completed let's say x road was resurfaced last month and there was a number of issues on that road when those remedial work gets fixed once it's been identified. OK, um, it will vary depending on the severity of the defect. If it is a, a delamination or there's some stone coming loose, it's not a, 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 a risk at this point in time. It goes onto the remedial list before they'll, after the two years, they'll come around and walk with us to the site. So we'll give them a list. If it's an urgent thing that's failed, yeah. then they get they get called in to come do it quicker. So it all depends on the severity of the defect. And if it is dangerous, our own teams will make it safe and we will right. deduct the cost of that from their um, retention. So there, there is a process in place 
place for us to deal with any remedial works uh, that take place. I mean, um, for example, when we did the 491 residential roads in microasphalt, there is a very small number that have failed, but we're talking one or two roads. Yeah. So it's a small percentage, and those will be have to be readdressed when they come back in, because we still got a short list of microsites to be completed. So there will be an opportunity, but but it's really down to the severity of the defect that will choose decide when they're coming back. Okay, which we that. decide by that. We, we make that decision as a council. Okay. Don't leave it to the co contractor. OK, thank you for that. On a 4.25 uh, of the concrete roads, which talks about other maintenance, which can be done on concrete roads uh, and uh, which is rightly identified. Those, you know, uh, roads are there, but there's capping and, you know, and which, which is not visually good. Uh, what are those other maintenance uh, options or techniques? which is in place and how does that work? Okay, um, our engineering team will look at the, the, the road. So for a residential road, the micro asphalt is a really good product. I know it doesn't look very nice the day it goes down, but it does improve. And a lot of our roads now have settled out really nicely. So that is, it's a it's a right product for that kind of road. For the major roads, we have um, HRA hot rolled asphalt, although it's called hot roll is actually um, medium hot. It, it's, it's, it's a much lower temperature, but we call it hot rolled. So we have that as well. The concrete road solution is a bespoke solution because you, in, in, invariably those roads are actually in really good condition structurally below the surface. It's the, usually the top layer. So my, a Miles McAdam solution that we used was appropriate. There are one or two different companies that we will be trialing coming forward on concrete roads. Right. But the Miles McAdam one is a really good solution because it's an open graded solution, reduces the noise of the traffic, and it gives us 20 years plus life. So it's a really good uh, long-term product for us to deal. With alternate products, we're looking at uh, a preservation material, which is something which a company like Reinerfeld provide. Uh, Velocity have a similar product as well. And it's um, a, a sprayed injection, uh, bitumen emulsion that gets put on top of the on top of the existing road. It seeps into the existing bitumen and rejuvenates it. And what that does, it gives five years additional life to the road before you get to a point you need to plane it out and resurface it. And so, for example, Junction 12, uh, sorry, Junction 11, we're doing a, um, a collaborative scheme up there with Keeley Brothers, Velocity, um, Mion, um, and the National Highways. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to put preservation down uh, on that entire junction, and that should buy us five extra years and in five years time we'll do it again and at five years after that one more so we can get 15 years further life on it rather than go and resurface it it's only when you go up to junction 11 and realize what a big junction is is absolutely enormous very expensive to relay and it's very expensive polymer modified sma material up there so it's bespoke so yes there are other alternatives we also belong to elkrig the innovation group, the local uh, government uh, roads innovation group, and they are trialing all the time different products. And I am being bombarded, as you can imagine, by reps for different things. And we are definitely looking to, to trial things. In our in the report, I've asked for one percent of our capital funding to go towards innovation, one percent to go towards um, tree planting, etc. And this gives us the opportunity to trial and use products. Often we say trial, but for example, the preservation has been around for 15 years. We're not trialing it. We're going to be using it. But there are companies who come in with brand new products and we are trialing it all the time. Uh, we're trialing small bits of uh, temporary repairs, uh, etc. So it's a continual process of a trial renewal. Uh, the, the roads, uh, um, the RSTA, the Road Safety uh, uh, Traffic Association and, uh, and the Materials Association, we, we're members of all of those and we regularly are keeping in touch with what is coming up because we all know there's there's, um, you know, electrified vehicles are heavier. The trucks are going to be very heavy. We need to make sure that the materials that we're going to be using in the future can deal with that. We've also got extreme weather. We've got the, the drought, which no one ever thought would happen. We've got drought now. We've got the extreme cold. So we, we need to be able to be innovative and use and not be scared of trialing products. Yeah. The thing about trialing is you will fail sometimes, but it's a learning experience. Generally, we, we're trialing uh, bits that have been there around a bit of time and given us some good advice. So yes, we are always looking out for innovation. Okay, uh, thank you. I had the last one okay. and then I close it. I understand we do the portals at much cheaper cost comparing to the neighboring uh, councils, which is around 30, 35 pounds on average. Is there any plans to go and offer those services around uh, other councils? 
as you know, we have a commercial ambition and um, our highways and drainage team do very well. We have a negative budget, which is a contributor back to the council yeah. because of our commercial ambition. We're very stretched. So we haven't got the capability to go and, uh, for example, do it. However, saying that, we have been approached by uh, adjacent authorities to provide some um, pottery repairs. So we're in discussion with them. Um, we're also um, a part of an innovation group with the rest of the Berkshire authorities. And we were in discussions, in fact, yesterday around trialing um, a, a, another bespoke solution where we could, all of us could share the cost of a new vehicle, which is about 65,000 pounds, and then share the time because none of us can keep that vehicle mm -hmm. going for a whole year yeah. or justify the cost. But if we share it among six of us, suddenly we've got an opportunity to buy an innovative different technique that does pot or repairs and it can bring the prices down we're only competitive because our numbers of potholes are down and we've and we uh, and, and our teams are really um geared up to get in and get out as quick as possible and so it works for us and we're in an urban environment we've tried velocity with you know there's lots of different systems they're not all appropriate for an urban environment you know, there some solutions are for different areas, open country roads, etc. So we do trial them and we compare the costs. Usually with reading their traffic management costs are the killer because they, their solution is the same as ours cost, but we've got to provide two men in a van to stop go boards and you've added 800 pound to the, the, the day and, and suddenly we are cheaper in our solution. So it's horses for courses, keep on doing it. And yes, other councils do ask us to help. It's, it's a capacity issue at the moment. I think we found Councillor Singh's favourite topic. <laughs> um, I don't see any more indications. So if we could please then rec uh, read the recommended action on page 74. Agreed. Right, that's it for us. Thank you all for being a good committee over the last year. Um, get home, get something to eat. <laughs>